Hi, in today's episode, we have Naila Amin. Naila is a firebrand activist. She has a law in her name, the Naila Law. Yes, I repeat again, she has a law in her name, the Naila Law, which is against child marriage in New York State. So when Naila got married at 13, she got out with her own willpower. Today, she advocates to end child marriage in the US and globally. Welcome, Naila, and tell us your journey right from the start. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, Basically, my life story is of a regular Pakistani girl who, you know, immigrated to the United States at a very young age from Pakistan. I am Patan. I'm Pashtun. And I came here when I was four years old and uh, eight years old. I went back to Pakistan and my father behind my mother's back, told his, his brother asked him and said, can I have Nyla for my older son? And my dad agreed. And my mom, she didn't even know. So the next day I was like at a family gathering and all these teenage girls were giggling. And they were like, do you know what happened last night? And I said, no, I don't. And they were like, oh, you got engaged. And I was eight years old and I was just, I kind of laughed like a child would. And I didn't know what was going on. But after, shortly after that, Tariq was my first cousin slash ex-husband's name. He's my dad's oldest brother's son, my Taya's son. And he bought me a red dress. I was only eight and he was 21. He was 13 years my senior. and. He was grooming me basically from such a young age after he knew that I was like his property or gonna he was going to marry me in the future. So I returned back to America and I was in the fourth grade and I realized, you know, I like this boy. His name was Leo. And then I said to myself, Nyla, don't even bother because you know, this boy, you can never be with him. You belong to somebody else. And for a eight-year-old child to think that, it was just devastating. I knew I was different from all the other kids. At 13, I went back to Pakistan for my brother's wedding. And over there, they uh, dressed me up in a langa and put my sister's gold on me because she had just gotten married. And they took pictures of me. So when I come back to America and turn 14, I would go to United States Citizenship Immigration Services. And then they would approve for him to come to America. Because up until 2017, the age of marriage with parental consent was 14. They changed it to 17 in 2017. This is really fascinating, Naila, because in India, we always believe that, you know, the America, the U.S. is a very, it's a developed country and, you know, child marriage is just not allowed. But this is unbelievable when one gets to know that this is what happens, uh, you know, outside. So what happened with Tariq? You know, I mean, obviously at eight, nobody, young girls, we don't even comprehend what's in store. And uh, so what happened when he came down, you know, because I read and I read some horrific parts and I you know would like to hear it from you basically so what happened was that you know I got um I got the nikah done I came back to America I started high school and I realized that you know I was very very different from everybody else and um I realized that, you know, I had the nikah done and everything. And when I went, uh, basically, uh, I came back to America. I applied for Tariq to come here. And I started high school and I was becoming very, very westernized. My father, he didn't like it. He beat me. So I ran away from my house. And when I ran away, my a social worker in the school, she called Child Protective Services because my dad had hit me. I had some bruises on me and um, they took me away. I was put in a foster home. And when I was put in a foster home, they didn't know what, um, you know, halal food was or what being married at young age. You know, they're all gore log. 
So they thought maybe this girl has some psychiatric issues. Why is she saying, oh, she's married, you know? So it was a very hard for me. And I told myself, I don't like it here. So I went back to my parents' house. I ran away. And my parents convinced me. They were like, why don't you go back to Pakistan till you turn 18? This way, these people, social workers, they can not bother you. And then you can come back. And when I basically, you know, um, went back to Pakistan, I found myself in the child marriage trap. And they actually did my Ruksati in January of 2005. What is Ruksati? Yeah, Ruksati means when you leave your father's house, when you go live with the guy. A nikah can be done. They did the nikah at a young age for immigration purposes. But um, the Ruksati was done when I went to Pakistan when I was 15. They were like, oh, she's here anyways. Let's just do the Ruksati. Ruksati is when you leave your father's house and you go to live with him and, you know, become his wife and consummate the marriage and do everything that a married couple does. You basically go to live with him. Okay. And that was very, very tough on you, I'm sure, Naila. Yes, it was about two and a half, three months. So tell me something. Did you have anger towards your father? I mean, what is your relationship now with your parents? Now that you have a law with your uh, name, you know, are they uh, apologetic? Are they regretful of what they did to you? Yes, they're very apologetic. They're regretful. You know, they see the mental issues. It has caused me the depression, the anxiety, the chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. And my father sometimes says, was I deaf? Was I blind? You know, uh, why did I do this to my daughter? And, um, you know, they are regretful. They're very proud of me. And um, we have a pretty cool relationship. I have, you know, I got married again. And I think he loves my husband more than me. You remarried now, Naila? Yes, I am happily remarried. Lovely. And where did you meet your husband? Uh, We met on single Muslims. Okay. We met on single Muslims. He's from England. And um, I went to go see him in England. And then I met his mom. And then Bat Bucky, they, they were like, we like her. She likes him. He likes her. And I got engaged. Um... We met on Valentine's Day and then I went to go buy my Langa in England, but then the pandemic happened. So what I did was when the pandemic happened, we couldn't stay in one house and not be married. So we had the nikah done in the house and I was a pandemic bride. How lovely is that, Naila? You're a pandemic bride, but you have so much more going for you. So when you talk about post-traumatic issues that you faced, you know, I mean, what is it that you remember as one of the, you know, that instance in your life that you felt that the walls were closing in on you, but you came out of it and why this is very important for us to have in this interview, because there are countless number of women who young girls who get married at a very, very young age all across India and Pakistan, I'm sure, you know, and uh, they do not even know how to navigate their life because society is so skewed towards, uh, you know, making the girl feel lesser about herself. Society is so skewed. The whole concept of marriage, I mean, hats off to you to again remarry and, you know, have the bravery to do it. But there are many people who will not have the bravery to do it because, you know, men are conditioned to, the in-laws sometimes are so, you know, they don't accept the girl or they make her feel lesser about herself. And parents sometimes don't want the little girl back. Do share with us that moment, you know, while you were in Pakistan. I mean, having been raised all your life in the US and obviously you had a very liberal um, environment around you, you know, though I do understand with so many interviews that I've done that Asian parents just try so hard to keep the children Asian in spite of being in a white, um, you know, background and, you know, with having, uh, like you use the word Goras all around because their culture is very different. So children go through a huge shift mentally because they really don't know which world they belong to. You know, do they belong to the world that they go outside their homes that they see or do they belong to the homes that they come back to? So how was this whole experience for you, Naila? I think for me, it was the daunting moment was, you know, when he took my cell phone away, he took my music away. 
And he treated me like I wasn't a human. The first time he had sex with me, he laid me naked on the floor in January weather on cement floors. And he said, it's your body, but I own it. And that just set a fire in me. And I said to myself, hell no. You know, I don't want to curse right now, but I said, hell no, I am not going to let this happen. So I started finding ways to try to run away, but I always got caught and always got beat up and um, was threatened with an honor killing and being sold into prostitution and just so many things that I said to myself, I don't care if I die trying, I am going to get away from him. It made a zit It was my zid, my resiliency, because if you don't fight for you, nobody else will. You have to be your own hero. What kind of example are we giving our future generations when we sit here? We are suffering the traumas of our mothers, what they couldn't do. We are suffering that now. And I don't want my daughters or granddaughters or great grandchildren to go through this. So I said, someone needs to put an end to this and it's going to be me. I don't want to live like this. The resilience that I can hear in your voice when you say that, you know, what your mother has gone through, you didn't want to go through. And you also spoke about honor killing and prostitution. Um, How did honor killing come into this whole thing? Is it because you left Tariq and you wanted to come back, uh, you know, to the US? You wanted to come back to your old life? Was there honor killing that was done for you by your relatives, your family? So what happened is the first time that I ran away from my house, I was gone for like 10, 12 hours. And if a girl leaves the house, God knows what she could be doing all these hours. She's away. I could have been with a man. They were accusing me of, you know, being with other people and that I was a whore. And they had to lock my dad in a room. He had a gun. And I was beaten in front of my mother and sisters and his whole family and dragged from my hair from one end to the other I bought dishonor to them by leaving the house. Oh my God, my heart reaches out to you, Nyla. Do these things really happen in the world? I mean, I do hear these kind of horror stories of people being beaten up. And of course, honor killing is such a such an issue even in Punjab in India. And we keep hearing a lot of honor killing stories across north of India and actually all of India. But then north of India, we do hear a lot of these stories. And it seems, it seems like we're in the dark ages even now, you know. Now that you're getting married again, you know, what is the fear that you have inside you or have you completely healed, Naila? I'm still working on my heal. I don't think you ever completely heal from this, you know. There are days when I just can't get out of bed and I have to keep fighting. It's like a dark cloud over my head, but it's, you know, messages from other young girls that I get that because of you, I got out of bed today. Thank you so much. Or you saved my life or me getting a girl extracted from Kenya or Ethiopia and helping her return back home and helping, you know, the gay man in Pakistan get the right resources so he's not killed in honor, killing. That's what makes it, that's what keeps it going for me. And, you know, my greatest fear is I, I, I was very scared when I first got married, but, you know, luckily my in-laws are Punjabi. They're just the sweetest, kindest, most funniest people. Um, And, you know, he took all of that pain away from me and he's so understanding. I've been, you know, married for over a year and I still haven't done laundry. So I think that should tell you he's a good man. Oh, how wonderful. I'm so happy for you, Naila. Naila, you know, when we talk about trauma, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, I would want the listeners and there are so many girls who are part of my, uh, you know, who listen to my podcast. You know, so when we go through trauma, you can't get over, you can't erase some of those images, you know, that stay back in your head. You know, those are images that keep recurring. And what is that one image that like, I've gone through trauma in my life and those traumatic experiences, they come like a film, you know, and, you know, they they come like a film and then they stay for a bit and then you deal with those emotions and, you know, you address them sometimes, you don't address them sometimes and then you slowly get back to normalcy, right? And the brain processes this whole thing. So which is that one episode that 
you know, is a recurring uh, thing in your head when you talk about this dark cloud. What is that cloud? I think it's the feeling of the helplessness over my own body that I was getting raped when the nighttime used to fall and it would get dark. I used to look at little ch- children and think, oh my God, they're so lucky they get to go home with their mom and I have to stay here with this monster. For me, you know, for me, it was when nighttime would occur and I realized that I have to sleep with him. That constantly plays in my mind and I have these recurring dreams. For the first 10 years, it was every day and now I'll have months where I have the same dream every day that I'm being forced to marry him and I have to leave my husband. And it's so scary because I'm being forced to marry someone and it's the same house. I've never seen this house, but in my dream, it's this big, big like Haveli type of place and I'm being forced to get married. And it occurs every time, the same dream. And then it stops for some months, then it comes back. So trauma is something we never get over. It'll pop up into our lives, you know, when we least expect it or if we're triggered by something. It never goes away. I will always have a scar. You know what I mean? Yes, I, will I do know that. always have a mark. Yes, I do know that. And I, and, I, and I completely relate when you talk about scars. Yes, there are some scars in your life that never leave you. And, you know, when you meet somebody, they can just trigger that scar back in your life by a small sentence or row. And once it's a lot of work within yourself to become stronger, which is really, really a very, very arduous journey. But it must be so amazing to know that there's something called the Nyla Law. And tell me this whole thing, you know, how you, the hard work you went through, you know, in getting the signature of all the members and passing this law. Tell us a little bit about that. So in February of 2018, I went to Assemblyman Philip Ramos' office here on Long Island. And I said to him, look, I just helped New Jersey become the second state to raise their child marriage age to 18. I said, we're in New York. We're the greatest state. We're the best. We're better than everybody. And I know that sounds so ethnocentric, but New Yorkers are very cocky and conceited. We think we're the best. So I said to him, why is this allowed? He said to me, not under my watch. He said, don't worry. He's like, after hearing your story, he's like, I'm going to take over this bill and I'm going to introduce it in assembly. So, and the, uh, Basically, the bill was supposed to get a hearing in uh, last year during the pandemic. April, it was supposed to pass. But because of the pandemic, you know, the whole world shut down. So the bill just kind of slipped through the cracks. And I was still working on it. And then, you know, when the new year came around, I started calling all 150 assembly members of New York State, I emailed each and every single one of them and each and every single one of the senators in New York. And I said, will you join my fight in helping me end child marriage so we make sure no more Nylas are born in New York? And Senator Julia Salazar, who's in charge of you know, all issues in Senate related to women and minorities. When she saw my documentary, Phil Ramos sent it to her. She said, oh, my God, we need to get this passed. And um, she took it upon herself and they fought for it. And I called and my colleagues and other allies on change.org. I got half a million signatures. And we, you know, presented that it passed unanimously through Assembly and Senate. And then it sat on Governor Cuomo's desks for about a month. I had such bad anxiety. And then, um, you know, he was dealing with his own issues, sexual harassment and whatnot. So right before he resigned, he signed the bill. And Assemblyman Ramos, when it passed, he said, we're calling this bill Nyla's Law for the young lady who you know, um, inspired me to do this bill. And I still remember where I was sitting. I was sitting in the couch when I got an email. And when I got the email, basically, I just cried and cried and cried. 
And I didn't even read the Nyla's law part. I just read the governor signed the bill. And then when I looked at all the details, it said, AKA Nyla's law. I was like, oh my God. And it didn't hit me till like a few days ago. And I can now start feeling happy and excited and proud of myself. I'm so proud of you, Nyla. I am sitting here in India in a city called Bangalore. And I'm so proud of the fact that you had the guts, the gumption to go through 150 signatures and emails and, you know, uh, to constantly, I'm sure you must have followed up. You must have been at it, you know, to ensure because it comes from a space of your own, a space that goes beyond yourself, Naila. I am absolutely an honor that I have you today on my podcast. I want you to tell the listeners a little bit about the foundation that you are working on. Thank you so much for the kind words, Mo. I am glad to be here. Um, basically, I was 26 years old when I started the Naila Amin Foundation. And my goal is to open up the first shelter in America that will house girls under the age of 18, escaping honor violence, uh, forced marriages. It will t- it will cater to, it's for all women, but it will give South Asian women the space, the cultural competency, the halal food, the vegetarian food, um, to practice their religion, to go to mandir, to go to the masjid, to, to be who they want to be and also keep their culture with them. I didn't have that. When I was in foster care and in shelters, I had to eat pizza for six months because they didn't know what halal food was. So I want to give these girls that place. And for that, to open up that home, I need a lot of funding to you know buy a house and then get state grants and stuff. So what I do now is when girls reach out to me because I don't have the housing, I sent them to my colleagues Unchained at Last, who are based in New Jersey, or I sent them to Tahiri Justice Center or the AHA Foundation, and they find them housing. You know, they have full staff, they're paid. I'm a one-woman team who just does everything by myself. And most of the time, I'm putting my own money into traveling state to state. I'm doing everything on my own, you know. So. I, because I don't have the home, I send them out to other shel- other places that I know can send them to the right shelter. But if I get a girl who says, hey, I need your help, I'm stuck in Africa, in Kenya, for example, and I need your help. So what I'll do then is, depending on what European country she's from or America, I contact in America, I have all the contacts and I contacted the Heary Justice Center. They get the State Department involved and I move, I give them the case and then they extract the girl from Pakistan, India, Africa, uh, wherever she is. Um, the only problem is if you're not a UK citizen, uh, you know, European citizen or American citizen, it's very hard for me to get you out of there with the help of the embassies. Because, you know, in Pakistan, India, women are considered garbage. So that's what we do. And I am a motivational speaker in universities. I go and speak at different universities and functions. I'm getting an award on Sunday from the NASA County Asian American Council. So I'm really excited about that. And, you know, I just travel all over the country and share my story in universities. And I hope to come to India one day and share my story in, you know, universities and worldwide and let little girls know that if I can do it, you can do it too. This is my line, Naila, that if I can do it, you can do it too. Because exactly like the way you've said, I've also rebooted myself with a lot of... um, you know, struggles behind me. So I kind of completely know the resilience from where it comes. And have you ever been threatened by anybody, you know, while you started this journey, Naila? It would be fantastic to know how you overcame that. Well, I get a lot of them um, from the Haram police, <laughs> you know, the Pakistani men, uh, Muslim men on um, social media. Um, they say that I'm a spy like Malala. I'm an agent for the U.S. I'm not Muslim. I'm Nungi. I'm wearing dress. I don't have dupatta on. 
I should be killed. My father should have killed me when I was a baby. He should have choked me and killed me or buried me. Um, I get threats. If you come here, we're going to throw acid on your face. We're going to cut your face. Just, you know, crazy guys. And the funny part is, is that they try to hit on me in my DMs first. And then when I say no, then they get violent. Wow. Rejection. That's what makes yes. them behave like that. Hmm? Yes. Unbelievable. And to the point that they will go on my foundation page and put vulgar pictures up and write hateful, hateful comments. You should kill yourself. Um, she should kill herself for being a Western eyes or liking boys. She liked the boy at eight years old, but she was mad that she got engaged. There's a difference between engagement, honey, and a uh, little crush. Yes, there is. There's a huge difference. How do you deal with this whole thing, uh, you know, mentally when you see this, these sort of comments? Because it's so frightening, you know, for people who have this sort of an, you know, attitude towards women. It And acid and all of these things are frightening. I mean, it gives you the chills in your bones. How do you deal with that, Naila? I ignore them. I always make sure, you know, when I go to Pakistan, if I'm in such an area, I cover my face. <laughs> Um, and in my village, um, I feel safe, you know, but I'm, I don't think that, you know, my face is out there like that, that people are going to look for me or find me, you know what I mean? But, um, it is scary. I have nightmares. Um, I'm in therapy mode because healing is, I think, something I'm going to have to do for the rest of my life. I understand and I get that, Naila. Yeah, so I'm constantly in therapy. I'm doing yoga. I'm doing meditation. You know, I'm the crazy lady that hugs trees and sits in the grass and ground myself by putting my bare feet on the ground. And I'm very spiritual, you know, um, and I just, you know, keep myself emerged in my work in my family and um you know i just try to stay away from negativity and i have days small where i can't get out of bed and i cry and you know what i do i just let myself cry and i tell myself you're okay you're safe cry let it out tomorrow's gonna be a better day and then you know i take a nap eat some good food watch a little indian movie you know or something like that. I love my Bollywood movies and dramas and stuff. So, you know, I just keep myself busy. And I know it sounds like I have my shit together, but trust me, I'm a hot mess. You know, um, I'm, I'm doing always 50 things at once. And I just keep going. I don't know why, but I just keep going. Naila, going you're my sister. <laughs> I keep doing 50 to 100 things in a day. I just don't tire because I just think that's the only way a human being, you know, can not allow negative thoughts to come into their head. And the more occupied you are mentally doing meaningful things, I think it's such a beautiful way to heal. And yes, don't feel guilty about the food that you eat because your body wants that to feel good about it. And who's your favorite film hero from India? You have to tell this to us. I really, really like um, Siddharth Malhotra. <laughs> okay. I like Siddharth Malhotra. I really like um, the one that passed away. May he rest in peace. Irfan Sushant Khan? Singh. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. No, Sushant Singh. Yeah. I love Irfan Khan. I used to like Shah Rukh Khan. He's old now. Um, John Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> John Abraham is old too, Naila. But yes, he has a very ripped body. He's a hot yeah, old. He's, he's a hot old. You yeah, know? <laughs> I get that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank yeah. you so much, Naila, for being on today's episode. You are, you're a goddess. You have the spirit of a warrior inside you, Naila. May you never tire. And whenever I travel to New York, I look forward to meeting you. And when you come into India, please know that you have a home with me. And there are many women all across India who will relate to what you're saying because of social ostracism, we don't open our mouth. And we need more women like you who need to come out and speak about that 
journeys and the experiences that people can share and heal. So thank you, Naila. And kudos to Naila Law. I'm so honored to have you on my podcast today. Thank you so much for having me, Mo. And for every woman, every little girl out there listening, remember, if you don't fight for you, nobody else will. So stay strong. Fight for yourself. If I can do it, you can do it. Look, we are women. We have a portal between our legs. We give life. So who are these men to take that away from us? Be a woman. We And, you know, hear us roar and say no to these men. Say no to tradition. Say no to society. Resources are all around you. Just put in women resources in Google in your local area and take it from there. I know it's not always as easy as it sounds, but you have to be your own voice or else nobody cares. So thank you so much, Mo, for having me. And I look forward to meeting you very soon, okay? Absolutely. I look forward to having you. Like I said, that you have a home with me when you come down to India. I promise you halal food. <laughs> and I promise okay. you good, good food. And thank you so very much for being here today. Thank you so much. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services. Find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, and of course, all other major streaming services. With loads of love, we are Moody Mo Podcast, where Hatke is hot. <laughs>